In today's episode, we're talking about employee experience and a 32 hour work week experiment. From Engagement, I'm David Millay, and this is Flip the Switch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Flip the Switch, where we sit down with leaders in customer experience and employee experience, and we try to figure out what are the trends that they're paying attention to? What are the experiments that they're running? What are the principles that have driven success for them throughout their career? And we take all those things and we apply them to the world of sports and entertainment. Now, today's episode, we are sitting down with the CEO and founder of Indebted, which is a global debt collection company. Now, you might be asking, that does not seem like the normal profile for guests on here, but it's really, really interesting to me what Indebted has done. They have framed themselves up as a customer-centric debt collection agency, and you're going to hear Josh talk about some of the tactics that they've used to create emotional connections with their customers who owe them money. Now, typically for our listeners, that you might be working for a sports team, you might be saying, collecting money is the worst part of our jobs. That's where we get the most amount of complaints in renewals and in payments for season tickets and whatnot. But somehow Josh and his team have done a great job framing themselves up as making it easier for customers to resolve their debt journey by working with them. And he's going to go into some of those strategies and tactics in the first 10 minutes. But the majority of the conversation is not because of how customer centric they are, but how employee centric indebted really is. The main experiment that they've run to really showcase their employee centricity is this concept of the 32 hour work week. Now, you've probably got a ton of questions that come to your brain as soon as I say 32 hour work week, like what day do they take off? Is it all at the same time? How did they tackle that? Was it a pilot program? How did we're going to answer all those questions? Fear not. Um, So I don't want to steal any more thunder uh, from the conversation. I'm going to jump in in just a sec. Quick other things on indebted. They are all over the world, about 270 employees. So similar size to your pro sports organization or your big, big time college sports organization. There's going to be a lot of similarities with how they run their culture in stark contrast to, I think it was last week, we had John Rossman talking about Amazon and you might've had some some scalability questions there. Uh, This is going to be exactly uh, comparable for your organization. What Josh and his team have done at Indebted is super applicable. So without further ado, let's jump into this episode with Josh Foreman. Josh, welcome to the show. David, thank you for having me. All right, let's jump into it. This is going to be a great episode on employee experience. Um, when we we came across uh, you and Indebted by, we were doing some research for an employee experience retreat that we were doing with one of our clients. And we came across this article and the concept that you have at your company around a 32 hour work day. So, or 32 hour work week, I should say. Um, so used to be a 32 we, hour work day. <laughs> used to be, it used to feel like a 32 hour work day. Did. So before we jump into that though, give us a rundown on who your company is and what your company does for context before we jump into the incredible employee experience you've created. Yeah, definitely. So we are a technology business that is disrupting the sort of very ugly and traditional world of consumer debt collection. So, you know, when when you think about a, a debt collector calling a consumer for an overdue bill, you think about someone either showing up someone's house and, and demanding cash or calling someone endlessly or, or sending threatening letters. Uh, we are a, a digital take on that, that really sort of three things that differentiate us is we don't shop at people's houses and we, we very rarely send letters and we don't call people. Uh, we communicate with consumers through the channels that they prefer to connect with. So think about email, SMS, WhatsApp, live chat, et cetera. We use data science and machine learning to customize at the consumer level. So we, we understand the behavioral analytics and, and the properties of those consumers so we can engage with them the best way possible. And then the third thing is we tie that all together into an actually a, a positive consumer experience. So as crazy as it sounds, over 2,000 people have left us a positive five-star Google review for how great their experience was with a debt collector. And then we <laughs> basically provide that as a service to some of the largest, um, you know, fintech businesses, financial services, and, and utility and telco companies around the world. Got it. And so that's where we were talking a little bit earlier. It makes sense why some of those fintech companies are your customers because you're providing service for them because you're providing better customer experience than they can. I, I honestly, I, I mean, I think back to this service and I think back to when I first got out of college here in the US, right? Student loan debt is, is crazy. 
And I did, there was a loan that I had that I didn't even know that I had. And they were sending me letters to an address that didn't exist. And they're like, we've been trying to get a hold of you from six months. I'm like, somebody find my email address that's in a million places. It's on my LinkedIn. It's on yeah. my social handles. Like somebody send me an email and this thing gets paid tomorrow. Uh, right. And it seems like you guys are communicating where the customers are. So I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I, I had a very similar experience. Um, a, I think it was a leftover energy bill from a, a, a shared house I was staying at during college. And um, yeah, I think it was a couple of years into working where I realized I had something on my credit file. And I was like, what is this? And it's some $36 that was unpaid on some house that I had with a bunch of uni friends. And um, yeah, to, to your point, it's, you know, you're trying to contact me at a, a residence. I don't live at it more with details that are out of date, as opposed to just sending me an email or a text message. I could just jump on and pay that. And so that's a, a very big part of what we do today. How do you, before we jump into the employee side of things, I mean, again, a customer centric debt collection company, essentially. I mean, how do you guys stay up to date with consumer trends on where they want to communicate and where they want to be? Because I mean, that's obviously changing every day. But how do you guys stay up to date on really making sure you're communicating where your customers actually are? Yeah, so I think a big part of it is obviously leaning heavily on on our clients and the way that they have communicated or rather sort of engaged or originated those consumers. And so, so for example, if you think about like the buy now, pay later space, when we started supporting those type of businesses, we were like, okay, well, these consumers are originating online, typically through like a checkout, like in an e-commerce store. And so naturally the type of information they're most likely going to provide is certainly their email address front and first and foremost, and that's where they'll get the communication, if not certainly, you know, their cell phone number and receive some sort of text message or SMS. And so we, we heavily look at the data that's provided to us by our clients. Um, and then we also overlay that with all the data that we gather from communicating with millions of consumers every single month. And we look at that to understand what do we think is the best way to, for example, communicate with Josh or communicate with David. And then we tie that together into the sort of the science piece of that all. I love it. When you get those letters from customers saying, thank you. And again, yeah. if you're, th if you're talking about creating an emotional connection, most of our clients are sports teams. It's super easy to create gotcha. an emotional connection there. To create an emotional connection with a customer as a debt collection company is totally different. So when you get those letters and positive reviews, um, what are those positive reviews saying? I mean, what are the reasons why someone would leave you a positive review? Yeah, so I think that the number one thing is definitely the approach, right? So we lead with empathy and respect. And so like, for example, we don't sue people, we don't bankrupt people, we don't send threatening letters, we don't do anything like that. When you receive a message from us, and in fact, in the early days of the business, when we're trying to prove this and sell it, a lot of people are looking and go, there's no way this is intimidating enough or threatening enough to convince someone to pay. And, and our feedback was, does it need to be intimidating threat? Why don't we actually try and engage with this person on a human level, an emotional level? And so a, a big part of it is just saying to people, like, we understand that things happen. It could be like me, I forget to pay things all the time just because I'm running from one thing to another. I'm pretty OCD, so pretty ADD. And so therefore I'm like, look, I, you know, I'll miss things. And so a convenient text message, a convenient way to pay is half of the problem. The other half of the problem is that people can sometimes find themselves in difficult situations. And to use, like you said before, it's an emotional situation. It's something that people are typically embarrassed about. And sometimes it's thing they don't want to have a conversation with a human about. And so we provide channels to do self-service with their human engagement. But when they leave those reviews, typically it's people who are responding to our, to our communication. So to give you a high level, about 92% of every debt that we collect never touches a human. So it all through the machine and, and, and basically the, the processes that we've built. But that 8%, and it's 8% of a very large number, are customers who then respond to us and say, hey, look, I need help with something or I have a question. And when they do that, we route that to our, our customer service team. And because technology does 92% of the heavy lift, it means that the people that we have, um, you know, you know, on the phones or on the other side of live chat or email or SMS are people who are, their job is solely focused on helping that consumer out of a difficult position. Um, and we're able to do that because of technology, unlike our peers, where the entire sort of employee base is directed towards how much money can you collect for our staff, they're compensated on uh, consumer experience, five-star Google reviews and positive NPS scores. Um, and then we let the machine do, you know, the heavy lifting where it needs to on the side. And so. They get to have a conversation with a real person who's entirely focused on helping them out of a difficult situation. And, and that's where we end up with those reviews. I, I think there's a really valuable lesson here for a lot of our sports clients and a lot of other organizations as well with outbound customer service departments or, or more proactive customer service departments in that I think a lot of times this, this solve is let's hire more people and the phones are ringing off the hook. So let's hire more people. But 
we just did a, an episode with uh, John Rossman from Amazon talking about the best customer service is no is, is the customer doesn't even have to interact and call you, right? Totally. And and so I think that's the same thing here is if you let what I heard you say was if you let the technology handle the bulk of things with those smaller cases that really need that love and attention, you can go above and beyond for that smaller that smaller piece and nail your customer service. And I, I love that you guys are taking that. Definitely. And, and, you know, also as we think about the world that we live in today and, and how connected we are and how 24 seven, everything is to be able to provide to your point, like call center or, or customer service that sort of operates at that scale. So we do 24 seven across the globe and we're sort of lucky because of, you know, geographically where we're spread across and, and it get, allows us to be able to do that. But it's when we started to look at when people wanted to pay, it wasn't just between nine to five. Um, about 35% of all of our consumers who engage with us, engage with us outside of the hours of the traditional contact center, which means they can't even contact our original client because they're not open. And, you know, we, we re recognize that the easiest way for them to do that at two o'clock in the morning, if that's when they want to do it, or wherever it might be in the time that where they're traveling to, uh, is to be able to do it self-service and through, through a website. And that's the, again, the vast majority of people and how they do that. Incredible. Well, you guys have taken this human centric approach to interacting with customers. But again, the whole reason why, why we wanted to reach out to you and have you on the show is you've taken this really human centered design approach to your employee experience. And one of the experiments that you've run and that you've had multiple articles written about is this 32 hour work week. So talk us through this pilot program uh, that you conducted before rolling it out company wide. I mean, tell, tell us about the 32 hour work week that you've got. Yeah, definitely. And I think to set the context, you know, um, you mentioned before, you know, obviously, when you think about a debt collection agency, you don't think about sort of the way we run our business. It was very evident to me early on and, and reinforced in the early days of our business that if we were going to be successful, particularly in the technology category, our ability to attract and retain the very best people in the world to help us was going to be key. And the pitch of, hey, come and join a debt collection business was probably not going to be the best pitch, right? <laughs> so um, we really, I put a lot of em emphasis even early on into like what was our employee value proposition. And I think we always were ahead of the curve. We were always a heavy adopter of remote working. You know, we were very, I um, mean, you know, we had flexible work hours. We had unlimited paid time off. We had a bunch of things that were sort of, I would say, you know, consistent with what you would look at in terms of the top employers, particularly in the technology category. Then moved the scene of, of obviously COVID and the pandemic. And I think what we noticed um, with some of the key drivers for us were there was definitely a level of burnout across the business. People were living behind Zoom. And I think, one of the, the nice things that an office gave us was sort of almost a clear start time and end time, but we didn't see that. We saw people getting up at six, jumping on Zoom, finishing in their day at 8 p.m. on Zoom. And so you could notice this, this level of, you know, I would say fatigue across the organization, which was, which was clear. And then the second thing, and, and we sort of briefly um, spoke about this before we jumped on the call, was, you know, around that great resignation notion and the fact that it was becoming so hard to find great people and, and retain those people. And so we really wanted to come up with something that we thought was a, a big differentiator for us and that would really touch on those things. And there was a final third part, which was probably more of a hypothesis at the time. And I think it's been proven true now, which is that we saw a consistent theme around, you know, particularly our very, very top talent, wanting to do something that's outside of work, right? You've got your home life and you've got your work life, but people wanted something else, whether it was starting a side business, whether it's playing sport whether it's spending time with a new child or family member, whether it's volunteering, whatever those things were. And there was really no time to be able to do that. And so our ability to try and solve those three things, helping with that burnout, you know, being able to attract and retain great talent and also giving people some time to be able to um, engage with things that are just not outside of work, sort of gave us a pretty clear map to work within. And we really thought, you know, this four day work week, first initially experiment and, and now being obviously con consistent across the business, was probably the only thing that was going to be able to move the needle cons you know, consistently in that way. Um, and so that led to us to making that decision and running a small pilot. All right. Let's, I have so many questions and that's where we're going to spend the rest of the episode, I think. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more about other employee experience. Uh, I, I got to imagine there's other things that you guys have done as well. Um, sure. Well, let's start here. Let's start with the pilot program. If you're trying to initiate something like this, I mean, it, it would be intimidating for me to roll this out to a, an entire company all at one time. I, I would feel like there would be a lot of risk involved there. So talk to us about how you approached running a pilot program for something like this. Yeah, sure. So we, I think one thing I'll set as the, as the stage is we were pretty aware that it was going to be a hard thing to roll back. So we had to enter into this 
experiment knowing that we really, really, really want this to work. It's like one of my board members said to me, he's like, I'm pretty sure this will be one of the hardest things to ever roll back if this doesn't work. And so <laughs> we wanted to invest really heavily in, and, and, and we truly genuinely believe that like, we, this will be awesome. It, the onus of responsibility is not just on me and, and the executive team, but on bringing the whole organization in. It's a great initiative to making it successful. So with that in mind, I think, you know, we, we led with a bunch of transparent communication around the fact that, you know, this is why we're doing it. This is why we're running the experiment. And the fact that it's invariably going to be challenges as we get live and go through that process, right? In terms of stuff going into, like you said, how do we roll it across the organization being, which parts of the organization can we start with? What are going to be some of the more challenging functions, et cetera. So we, we had to sort of set that scene uh, pretty clearly. And then we went through the process of jumping in and actually going function to function and starting to gain feedback and understanding, okay, what, what is A, that you're, you know, your feedback to this idea? Is it something you're excited about? Is it something you think will help you with your hiring goals? Is it something you think you help with engagement? And then where do you perceive the challenges of actually rolling this out? Um, so the first part was that data gathering exercise and then doing an assessment on, you know, where was it going to be easy? Where was it going to be hard? And what do we need to think about? That initial communication, I'm guessing that had to have come from you and not any of your lieutenants or anything. I mean, that's got to, something like that to me has got to come from a tip top, right? Yeah, definitely. So I, I spoke with my exec team first. We got buy-in, heard obviously their feedback and consensus. And then we jumped in a company all hands Zoom call and said, look, like okay. this is what we want to do. And lots of smiles on the other side, definitely. Lots of like, you know, happy faces. And then, you know, obviously then the hard work came, which is the actual implementation. When you, when you did those info sessions and you were actually like gathering, hey, how would this work in your department? How would this work in your department? What was some of the pushback that you got? Because I, I, as great an idea as it sounds, there are definitely some, I, I'm thinking about different clients that we have right now, different organizations that I've worked with over the years. And I can think of certain people that would just be like, that are, that, that are great, that are just grinders, but they believe in that hustle 80 hours yep. a week and they would give pushbacks, I would imagine. So what were some of the things that, that you're thinking about that, that gave you obstacles to rolling this out. Yeah. So there's, there's the natural fear of what if productivity drops by 20%, right? So you cut a day out. So what is, what does that mean? Um, and I think to be honest, we went into it almost saying, let's assume that's going to happen because wow. there's another upside that we, we want to look at. It didn't happen, uh, which was awesome. But the reason for that is, you know, we, we were trying to hire and grow incredibly fast. And essentially the way I look at it is if I have 10 open roles that are unfilled, I'm my, my output there is zero. If I have those 10 roles filled and we have a 20% cut in productivity, the output's eight, still better than zero. Eight's better than zero every day of the week. And so that was how I think we initially thought about it. And then anything from there that where it wasn't eight, it was nine or 10 would, would, would be upside. So there's productivity is one. I think the other one are teams where they're still growing and forming. You know, when you've got a team that has key people missing or you've got people out on leave or you've got, you know, sort of roles transitioning, typically the person, you know, sort of running that team is going to carry the slack, right? And so to your point, they're pulling the extra hours, they're lifting the heavy work for their team. So the notion for them to do less is an immediate challenge and it's a very fair one as well. Um, and it's something that we sort of definitely had to, to understand and, and sort of work through. And then I think the third one would be just the simple logistics. Like, are we all off on the same day? Do we do staggering days? What does that mean for connecting with people? Um, and like, how is this actually going to play out in, in practicality in terms of are people actually going to take the time off or is this just sort of like a gimmick essentially? Yeah. I mean, these are all the questions that I'm about to ask, right? These are all things <laughs> that I'd be throwing out as objections. I mean, so, uh, I mean, my, my first thing would be, uh, yeah, I, like if my brain goes to like a group project in school, right? You're, yeah. There's always one person that is carrying the load more than everybody else. And to me, if I'm that person on the team. I'm like, dude, we're already struggling. Now I'm going to carry the weight even more. How did you, how did you combat that? How did you make sure that didn't happen? Yeah. So I think we had a couple of things. One is before we actually went to the experiment and then eventually rolled it out completely, we, we had a fairly rigorous uh, goal setting process as a company. And so we had done that exercise prior and said, this is what we're going to achieve as a company. This is what each function and each team and each individual wants to achieve throughout the year. And so the first question we asked everybody once they were super excited about the notion of, yeah, like an extra day off, that's great. It's, can you still deliver on your goals? So you set this goal, you know, whether it's one day, whether it's five days you're working, can you still hit it? And about 93% of people said, yes, I can still do what I said I was going to do, even with a day less. Um, and so that was insightful in itself, right? We're like, well, okay, what does that, what does that actually mean? Could we have set bigger goals or could it simply have just been the fact that people realize that 
there is always a chunk of your week that's spent, whether it's distracted on something else or whether it's other things that are happening. And the reality is that we could be smarter with our time and so work smarter and, and, and not harder, so to speak. Um, so that was definitely, I guess, a, one of the, one of the core components of it. Um, and then I think probably the, the other part in terms of how we would have, I guess, how we went through the a process of approaching it and how we sort of brought that, I guess, notion of, of teamwork to it is that we made it very clear to the rest of the team that for some teams, it's going to be very easy. So if you think about like, we think about product or engineering uh, teams where they're already heavily remote and behind a computer doing work and, and sort of able to sort of spend that deep work time. It's far easier for them to roll into this process than it is for like a sales team um, or, or a marketing team who are engaging all the time or like out in a field or doing something like that. And so we really made sure helpful that we need each team to help one another. And so, for example, what are the things that are drawing them into having to do that extra day? Or why is it that they feel need to be in the office or, you know, on that particular call or doing that. And how can each other team help them unlock that? To give you a practical example of this, one of them was our customer service team. So the natural problem we have there is we run a 24 seven global customer service. So how can we have a, you know, basically 20% of that cut out? It's not 24 seven. So rostering was one thing, but the rostering part became difficult because there was a bunch of other sub teams that that core team relied on. So if someone needs a refund, you need to engage with our finance team or if someone has like a technical problem, you need to engage with our IT team. So we made sure that those teams then put self-service technology or self-service tooling in such that they could cover them in those outside hours and that they would all sort of, you know, stagger from a level of flexibility to be able to support one another. So there's a lot of groundwork that you had to lay that said, if this person's not going to be in the office, somebody still needs to go and access what that person knows in their head and needs to be able to grab that and go able to still do their job, right? And absolutely. absolutely. And I think, you know, the way I look at it is if our biggest client sends us an email on a Friday, we'd better still respond to that email, right? Like we can't just be like, Hey, it's a, it's Friday. It's a, it's a holiday for us. We'll talk to you on Monday. Like that's not, that's not cool. So we needed to find a way to be able to, to address that problem. Well, and it, so this to me then leads us into this kind of conversation of synchronous versus asynchronous, asynchronous work. Right. Uh, so maybe for our listeners that have never heard those terms, maybe describe that and then describe a little bit about how that came into play. And maybe this gets us into the question of, did you decide on, are we all working on one? Are we all taking the same day off? How does that work? Yeah, definitely. So I think, um, you know, the, the synchronous asynchronous debate thing is the easiest way to think about it is, you know, do you need to be physically present or can you, can you respond at your own time and convenience? Right. So obviously, you know, we're on this podcast now, uh, it's not very helpful for the two of you. If I just walk away for, for an hour and then come back and start answering the other part of the question, right? So I need to be present, but if you send me an email, you know, you, there's not necessarily that impending, you've got to write back immediately, like it's an instant message and conversation. That's how I like to sort of think about synchronous and asynchronous as a whole. And so the, the natural part there, and actually when we get into some of the things that we use to help make the four day work week successful, one of the biggest things was we cut back meetings aggressively because we said to people like, if we need to save 20% of everyone's calendar, we can all agree that the biggest part of that problem is just meetings for the sake of meetings, right? So if there's eight hours of meetings we don't need to be doing, there's that eight hour day that we don't have to have off and we can find and use that time better. And I think if anything, all it did for the rest of the organization was gave everyone almost a, like a, a card to be able to say, Hey, I'm going to change our meeting from fortnightly to weekly, or I'm going to change it from fortnightly to monthly. And everyone was almost trading those cards for once and, and felt okay to have that conversation because we were all basically going through our calendars ferociously trying to find free time that we could make sure we had to, to get work done. Um, so that was the, that was the first part. And then when you mentioned around sort of what day we decided where it is today is the vast majority of our organization has Fridays off. And then where we have some customer or client facing teams, we do a staggered roster. So I think Monday to Thursday and Tuesday to Friday in order to be able to cover those key portions. But, and that's only because there, there's just no other logistical way around that. Um, but if otherwise based on, on our preference, it's everybody to have, have Friday off uh, and I can My that for you if you like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, let's, we can go into it in a, in a little bit deeper here in just a second. I, I have one more like objection that I would give. If I'm a sales guy and you tell me that, uh, you know, I, I've got to work 32 hours or somebody that is incentivized with bonus commission and they're not hitting that. I mean, how, how do you tell somebody that wants to work 32 hours that they can't, how are you capping? Is it a hard cap? It's just my last objection on this. 
Yeah, definitely. Look, I, I think it would be, um, it's unrealistic that everybody's going to get to it, right? And so we actually have a monthly pulse survey that we we check in on staff and ask the question like, are you able to get everything done? Are you utilizing your four-day work week, et cetera? And I think if anything the data shows is like there's definitely, particularly in our senior leadership team where, you know, issues will happen and things come up and you have to solve problems. If anyone's probably utilizing it less, it's it's at that level, but still there is still a massive utilization of it, right? So there's always subsets of, of things. Um, you know, today is my Friday, right? I still really want to do this conversation. The calendar was packed, et cetera, this week. So I'm, I'm more than happy to jump on and I've got a couple other little bits and pieces I want to do. But certainly by 11 a.m. this morning, I'm done. I'm going to go for a run, go to the beach, get some personal time in and just and sort of try and switch off. Um, so I'm still very grateful for that, irrespective of. Um, but also there will always be people who are super motivated. The interesting thing is a lot of them still appreciate the quiet time, right? So for example, if you really want to get some some calls done or you really want to get a couple of deals closed or you really want to finish off some, I don't know, coding or whatever it is for one of our engineers, having a Friday where like you get virtually no emails or Slack messages or phone calls is actually a great time to get some of that deep work done. Um, and it just provides that level of flexibility. So I think, look, 85% of people get the full utilization. It's probably another 10% that get a bit of it and it's 5% where, you know, it's always a little bit harder, um, but we trust people will make the right choice and, and find the right balance for them. Well, and I think, I think it is really key. I mean, anytime you're rolling out any type of employee experience initiative like this, that is a benefit or a perk. I, I think it's great what you said where, you know, by 11 a.m. you're going to try to be out at the beach because I think if as senior leaders, you're not taking advantage of it, it, it does set a tone of to the people underneath you that says it, you run the risk of saying, well, if I want to be a senior leader, 32 hours is for everybody else. If I want to be a senior leader, look at my senior leaders. They're all working Correct. 40 hours a week. I need to go work 40 hours a week. And then you start to create all kinds of weird divides in the culture. So I think it is great that you guys are really practicing and taking advantage of the initiative. I think it's important to the overall health of the initiative uh, itself. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if, if you put this in just like into for, you know, a sports context, right? You play a, a key game on a weekend, you still train during the week, right? And so the notion that you might not be actually physically in the event and, and doing it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not working or it's not somehow beneficial to the core thing that you do. And I actually think when we start to get more and more data on how our teams spend that extra day, I think we find more times than not, it's somehow inadvertently positive to them and their personal development. I will listen to a podcast about something. I'll gain an insight in something that'll help me on a decision I have to do next week. I've got a bunch of team members who've started their own side businesses. Um, one of them came up to me like about a month ago and was like, hey, so I've got this online jewelry store I'm now running on Fridays and I'm having some trouble acquiring a customers. Like, you know, how does our customer acquisition engine work at Indebted and how does that apply? And can you help me with that? That is a person who doesn't work in our marketing team who's now understanding core marketing skills, customer acquisition skills that they're applying into their current role. And so I think that even though you can't say, hey, it was a directly indebted related work experience, it's the same thing as an athlete who's going to stay, you know, physically peaked during off season so they can make sure they're primed during on season. I think to me, that's exactly the same analogy that applies here when we think about top performance. hundred percent the same analogy. I'm right on board with you there. Um, so now that you have it in place, I mean, what are some of the key things that as the leadership team that you've done to really make sure that it continues to thrive? Uh, what what are some of those those initiatives that you've done to really help make sure that we're we're keeping it living? Yes, we have to have a pulse on the organization. So we we literally run a monthly pulse survey um, to ask people, you know, how is it, are they utilizing it? What's working and what's not working, et cetera. And we track that, we track the trends on that. So we're tracking stress levels, engagement levels, productivity, access to other people in the organization, the ability to get their job done. Are you on track for your goals and objectives for the year? Um, and we, we keep a close eye on that. I would say for the vast part, it's moving up and into the right direction. There are a couple of issues where people feel sometimes, like you said, stretched and, and unable to get, get on top of some things they need to do or have access to certain people and tooling. Um, I think the big thing, probably the biggest learning is our ability to have um, that information available asynchronously, right? So it's just like, if I'm a new starter and I'm used to just pinging someone and say, hey, like, where, where do I find this or where do I find that? And they don't respond on a Friday. It's way easier uh, to be able to just jump on onto a wiki or into a document and be like, oh yeah, cool, that's how I need to do that and be able to fetch that information when it when it best suits. Um, so I think that's that's the probably the key piece is is keeping the pulse on this on the on the organization yeah. and then using that data to adjust how you want to move forward. 
we we've talked about pulse surveys on this show a ton and and right now we're working with one of our clients to get those implemented in their culture and it, it is just one of those things where i mean i used to be you know 10 years ago when we were doing this type of culture work we'd love the big employee experience survey that we'd run biannually it would take us you know two months to get the data analyzed and you know it was it was snowing on that day so the data was more negative than it could have been whereas with a regular consistent pulse survey that's just one or two questions i i have found you can get far better data that's more up to date that's more accurate that actually lets you be actionable and and it also it's like for for some of our bigger organizations that work within a, the context of a like a bigger university or something uh, it's so much easier to get approved just send attaching a one question thing at the bottom of an email than a 23 question survey so that's big fans of pulse surveys. And I, I think it's a key to providing that psychological safety for people to give feedback as to how things are actually going. Definitely. And, um, and the first thing we, we track on our surveys is engagement on the survey. So how many people complete it, right? And so the shorter and more consistent and easier it is, the better you get. Because there's nothing worse than a survey with 30% res- response rate because it's not really indicative of the majority of your company. Right. So you really want to get the, the vast majority there so you know that you're actually act- you're using real actionable data. Quick technical question. When you guys think about asynchronous work and you think about what you were talking about earlier, um, what are some of the tools that you guys use? Is it Teams? Is it Slack? Do you heavily rely on Google Docs? You mentioned wikis. Um, talk a little bit about like some of the actual tools that you're using to implement this to encourage more a- asynchronous communication. Yeah, so um, big utilizer of, of, of the Google Suites or Google Docs and Google Slides and, and everything involved. Um, Slack is the the core communication hub for the business without question um, and then bolted onto that we've got zoom obviously on, on the video side and then a few other teams will have a couple other bespoke things we've got, I started using loom recently which is really obviously about record our slides that we're doing on google and the, the zoom component and share that that's super helpful i do all of my all hands and updates that way because there's probably nothing worse for productivity than stopping the entire organization to listen to me speak or rant on for a while so we're now to give people the ability to digest that when they want to um, and we've also had to deal with asynchronously simply as a result of the organization so spread. Um, you know, when it's 8 a.m. in the morning in Sydney, it is not 8 a.m. in the morning in London. Um, and it's, it's unpractical to expect that team members are going to have to get up in the middle of the night to to listen to something or join a meeting. Um, so they're, they're the core ones. And then there's a couple of other bespoke ones from team to team. Um, but that's definitely the, the the wider rollout for us across the business. Loom is a tool that we haven't talked as much about on this uh, uh, on this show, uh, but I think it is super underrated. It's a Google Chrome plugin that if you use Google Chrome, everybody listening, you can go on and grab it. And basically, it allows you to talk and screen record. And it is, it's great for doing a quick video, sending it out in an email and, and putting it out to your team. And it's so much more personable than an e- a, a memo email that you can send out. Yeah, and I find it's a lot quicker as well. Like, it, obviously, each person's different, and some people are like better off at writing an email. I'm, I'm not that way. It's easier for me just to get in front, you know, yeah. screen and just sort of talk through something. And so, I think it's a, a much quicker way to get information out and, and digest that as well. Well, let's talk about. I mean, when it comes to talent attraction, right? Again, having that extra twenty percent off to work on the jewelry store, like you mentioned, is is such a key thing. People want to have lives. And we all realized that during the pandemic that working from home, that we actually are spending time with our family. We're working on these side projects. Uh, it makes me think of um, when Google was running their 80-20 experiment where they said, you know, hey, one, of the, one day a week, you got to work on a, a side project that's related to Google, but different. H- have you seen any cool projects come up or pop up that have really directly benefited Indebted or have most of them been indirect, like the example that you mentioned with the, the marketing team? I think it's mostly indirect. Um, and then it's how you, how you perceive that benefit. I think like, you know, if I was to be on more of the selfish side, I'd want to see some sort of direct benefit to indebted, you know, revenue line or profit and profit loss line. But I also think I'm able to respect that there are indirect benefits, right? So one of the other ones from more of like a th- philanthropic perspective is we've got a couple of people in the organization who are very climate focused right? And all about how we can be more sustainable as an organization. That's resulted in a whole sustainability program that we're now starting to build into the business. That is beneficial for the company, even if it doesn't directly impact our revenue or profit and loss line. And to your point, when we go back to talent acquisition, the people who are joining our company care about those things as well, right? And so, you know, whether it's our giving back program, um, we ran one of those uh, at Christmas where we basically helped about 150 kids in the Philippines through education and schooling. 
Um, like, yes, no, it doesn't directly impact our, in fact, if we spend money on that because we want to invest in it, but we think by making, you know, better, whether it's the world a better place or addressing some of these key things, it invariably will somehow make, make and get it a better place. And I think then when we get to the individual growth element that I mentioned before, like with the online jewelry store example, I think it's hard to quantify that, but invariably, you know, you would always pay more for better talent, right? So people who are more experienced have more skills. And so in this case, I think allowing those people to develop those skills that aren't directly correlated to their day-to-day job is, is so valuable. It's just hard to quantify. Well, and, and you guys have seen a massive uptick from what I, from what I recall in the article, a massive uptick in the number of applications and the talent pool that you guys have gotten since you implemented this. Is that right? Can you Definitely. talk about some of those numbers? <clears throat> Yeah, it's absolutely. So just to set the context that so we are about 270 full-time employees across the world. Um, I think we were a hundred and something when we started the rollout of this. We last quarter, we grew about 71 people. Um, we'll probably do about the same this quarter. So we, we are very much like a hyper growth stage. So we've gone from two years ago, I think we were 20. A year ago, we were, we were 70. Today, we're 260. So it sort of sets the scene of how fast we're growing. Um, but in terms of our inbound applications, so immediately after the rollout of the four day work week and once sort of the natural press, you know, subsided from it and that, and that spike that you get easily with our inbound applications were more than double, uh, what they were before. Um, and so that, that was one thing. We also noticed the quality of the candidate profile went up and then in some areas, particularly the areas where we found it really difficult, the very highly competitive roles, um, to think about, you know, things in R and D product technology, data science, et cetera. Some of those were up three, four hundred percent, um, and so wow. that was, you know, not planned but super helpful, um, and it's allowed us to be able to you know, onboard an amazing amount of talent, and it's become, I mean, that in, as a part of our overall employee value prop has has really, really helped us a lot over the last few months. Well, I, I think it's funny that you say that because initially my thought would be if I'm a hiring manager and I'm using this as my value proposition, I'm thinking. Ah, uh, well, we're just going to get all the lazy people that are mm-hmm. going to come work here. But in reality, you're going to get the better people because what happens to the star talent on every team? They're the ones that get overloaded with projects. And so yep. to say that, hey, your time is going to be protected when you come work here at Dedded, as that's that's so attractive to the star talent. And uh, so it makes what you're saying actually makes sense when you when you start to spell it out. Definitely. And look, I think we we recognize there'll be some some people who might want to come through purely for the ability to work work less. Uh, but we trust in our, you know, our, our talent acquisition team and our people team and our, and our onboarding and recruitment processes to know that we've got the right way to select the very best people. So what this did is it opened at the top of the funnel, right? And so now we just get to pick from even more great people and find who are the right ones to, to join the team. And, and it's the process itself is a symbol that says we care about our people, truly. Right. Uh, well, well, let's talk about this real quick. Uh, just so we're, we're getting near our, our end time here. What other programs or initiatives, experiments are you guys toying with next to invest in and enhance the employee experience? Yeah, so the one that we rolled out somewhat similar in timing to this, um, and I think it, it correlates more so to the asynchronous piece, um, and we've since been fully rolled out, it, it's been successful, is a, we call it our remote working stipend. And so it's basically providing people a little bit of cash essentially every quarter. So we do a thousand US dollars a quarter per employee. And that is to invest in making sure they're as productive as possible at home. And so like some of the interesting ones were like, you know, different parts of the world, for example, like quality internet connections are expensive. And so, you know, naturally it doesn't make sense if you've got someone you need connected to the internet all the time to not have, you know, the very best internet connection. Um, and the cost of that can vary greatly, you know, from, from country to country. Then you've got things like if I'm sitting in a chair all day, like, should that really be like a $15 chair? <laughs> for our employee, or should that be something that's really good for them ergonomically? And so, you know, their health, um, and a, bu- and a bunch of other things. And so, and naturally, of course, our team are incurring some level of costs by working from home, right? Extra electricity, whether it's, you know, the whole, the whole list goes on. So we did a test of that in Australia, um, at the point during the pandemic, when our office lease also came up. So we're like, why mm. pay for an office lease when we're literally not allowed to go into the office? Let's save that money, but rather than just saving all of that cash, let's, let's roll this out as an alternative and see. And what was cool is it also allowed the people who did want to get back together and get into groups to get co-working spaces, to go have team catch-ups and lunches and meetings. So they were still able to get that, that personal connection whilst at the same time having the flexibility of working from home. And that was so successful 
um, in Australia that we rolled that out across the globe for, for our whole team. Um, and essentially, you know, it saves the business money in terms of a real estate cost. And even though we invest probably about half of it back in, into the team, everyone loves that benefit and it just takes that pressure off. It makes them more productive. You know, they've got the right tooling, they've got the right stuff they need to, to add it work well. I know Katie on our team would probably put soundproof, uh, soundproof, okay. uh, eggshells on her wall so that she could stop the dogs barking from next door. But Actually, that's uh, a good idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> I have the same problem. I mean, but when you get, when you give them free reign of like, Hey, here's a thousand dollars, use it towards home improvement around your office space. I mean, there's your employees know what they need more than anybody else. Right. Like that, that's exactly. where it's, it's so cool that you guys are doing that. Yeah, no, um, definitely. And, and, that, and that's probably, I would say the only other major one we've done since. And then of course we'll continue to look forward as we, as we evolve and, and see what, what comes next. Are there, these are my final two questions here. Sure. Um, well, before we get to like your billboard advice question. So one, uh, are there any other like trends or exper experiments in employee experience that you've kind of, that have piqued your interest as of late? It's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. I, nothing that immediately comes to mind out, outside of this topic. Like this is obviously one that I've spent right. so much time researching ahead of, ahead of the rollout. And then obviously uh, it's been actually great to see a lot of other companies follow, follow since. Oh, I've had yeah. a bunch of other CEOs and, and founders reach out for like feedback and I've been, I've tried to be as transparent as possible and sharing our internal materials and sharing sort of links to articles and stuff where, where it's been helpful. Um, but I think that, and then the one that I still think we as an organization have to do better at, and, and I've been learning from a lot of other people, um, is, is still that asynchronous piece because I don't think it comes naturally and the, there needs to be a balance. Um, and I'm also trying to understand that balance where like, there's still nothing better than catching up with your team, um, and, and, and having that time together. And so I think this interesting balance of asynchronous removing into hybrid um, particularly as now the rest of the world opens up and, and things come back to normal, so to speak. Um, that's going to be one of the challenges and opportunities that I think will present from that. No question. Um, well, the, the, the trend that's on my mind, just to throw something out there for you, is like similar to your remote work stipend. Can, can our employees have a remote stipend to use on Fiverr or Upwork or some of just like the menial administration tasks that people mm -hmm. or employees bang their head against the walls? Can we have somebody else do that? Now, there's all kinds of IT security questions that come into play there, but sure, sure. some sure. some more things about. Uh, what are last question before we get into advice? Uh, what's an opinion that you hear about around employee experience that you just flat out disagree with, and why? Like bad advice around employee experience. The notion that somehow people being present is a proxy for productivity. So this is like the number one reason why people want to people go back in the office, right? In certain organizations, because if you're in the office, you're working, so to speak. I think that's just ridiculous because you can sit at your desk and just go, go on Facebook, right? Like you, we all, we all understand how that works. And, um, that has also in some cases, I think translated to the remote working world. Um, so your status icon on, on Slack, if it's not on, you're not working. It's like, that's, that's also doesn't make sense. And, and having people have to check in and, you know, do the, the certain calls. So. I, I'm adamantly against that. And, and I always was even before the pandemic and obviously as we rolled into it and having to sort of transition the organizations, because I think if your entire proxy for productivity is, is time, you're not really focusing on the ultimate goal, which is outcome. Um, so outcome, not output. There's plenty of, we all know, like whether you apply this to professional sense or a sporting sense or whatever it may be, there are people who can do in 10 minutes what takes another person an hour. And so really what you should be focusing on is what is the outcome of that 10 minutes or that hour, irrespective of what it takes those individuals, um, not whether or not, you know, that person who it took 10 minutes for then sits there for 50 minutes looking like they're doing work as a proxy of what they got done. Set those output that you want to achieve as an organization. If that output's occurring, that should be your proxy for the business being productive, you know, productive and not the other way around. Totally agree. Results only. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, Josh, any final words of advice for our, our senior leaders that are listening to the, uh, to the episode? So I think, you know, and, and not, not to sort of be counter to obviously all the positivity that we've had as, as an organization, but I don't necessarily know it is for all businesses. You know, I have, I have spoken to a bunch of different companies and there's been calls that I've got off of where I've said, I'm not sure if that's exactly, exactly what they need. Um, and obviously, you know, I don't know the inner workings of every single possible business. So I'm sure there's all these different types of permutations of where it makes sense and doesn't. I think that the core thing is it's got to come from a genuine place. 
And for us, you know, it was a, something genuinely we wanted to do. And it, it really had to touch on those three things I mentioned earlier in, in the episode and, and particularly, you know, our ability on attracting and retaining that talent and making sure that the people who work at the company, um, are productive and they're not burnt out and they don't, they're not overworked, et cetera. And so you, for us, that was a challenge we had to solve. You know, I think if you're a business that, for example, that's maybe not trying to grow aggressively or you're, you know, you don't have some of those problems, then embarking on that giant what amount of work that it is, because it is, it's a huge amount of work to outlay. And, and I can't underestimate that, that again and then can't over, over, you know, over, over exemplify that. But um, if it is though, however, those sort of challenges that your business is facing, then it is definitely an interesting one. I'm also a big believer that I think this sort of stuff is grabbing hold. And so I, you know, what we, I remember we had this conversation at a board level is, do we want to be the organization that sets the trend or do we want to be the one that follows it? And what do we think will be better? Our, our employees seeing that we were the one that set the trend and they're like, wow, they genuinely care. They pushed the needle. You know, we went against the status quo. We fought against the pushback or are we the one getting dragged across the line because you're like one of the last businesses that that to make it happen? Um, which is the way I think about remote working. And so I think there is that component that leaders have to take into account as well, is that if you're going to get pulled across the line, it's maybe better to be sort of seen as one sort of walking in and following that trend and adopting it otherwise. Great words of wisdom to close this out. Josh, I really appreciate the time. Um, where, yeah, can people so. fo- where can people follow along the journey, uh, see what Indebted's up to, hear more about uh, your takes on the business and employee experience? Where can people reach you? Um, LinkedIn is probably definitely the best, just um, particularly on, on our data page and, and all the stuff that we share there, as well as our, our company blog on our website, um, otherwise on Twitter as well. Perfect. And what's your Twitter handle? Do you have one? Are you Josh on it? Foreman. Yeah, just slash Josh, Josh Foreman. Foreman. All right, I'm going to hit you with a follow right after this. So uh, awesome. everybody listening, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Josh, it's been a pleasure. We'll talk soon. Thanks, David. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Hey guys, before you head out, just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. That helps more of your peers find the show as they search for ways to get better in their own roles. But this podcast is just a small part of what we do at Engagement. In our normal day in the office, we're crazy focused on helping athletic departments and sports and entertainment companies generate more revenue by becoming more customer-centric. To see how we might be able to help your organization, Visit engagementpartners.com to learn more. Download a free guide, check out our blogs and case studies, or schedule a call with us if you want to see how we can help with your particular objectives. Our goal is to help you create deeper connections with fans and generate more revenue. So when you're with us, hopefully you find a nugget or two that helps your cause.